Uh, welcome today. I am so glad you're here. I am really excited about um, going through and talking about this topic today, teaching your child financial responsibility. So one of the things and why this to me is so, so important is adults with ADHD and their relationships with money and finances can be at best described as chaotic sometimes um, <laughs> and at worst can be described oftentimes in much worse ways. So um, some of the things that research shows about adults with ADHD, um, anecdotal evidence that um, I've gathered over my time working with adults with ADHD, some of the struggles are listed here on this page. The um, impulse buying, that's that, oh, I've had a bad day at work, I'm gonna treat myself to whatever it is. Um, and maybe, wow, this isn't what I was going to come to Costco for today, but wow, I just walked out with $600 worth of stuff when I really was coming to get bacon and chicken or whatever it is. That impulse buying, poor credit choices. And what that really means is, is possibly having to take out credit at a very, very high interest rate, um, payday loans, high interest rate loans, um, get, getting a car that's more than you can afford that then comes with a higher, um, higher interest rate loan, those sort of things. So struggling to make those choices as best as possible. Um, a lot of individuals with ADHD, because of the impulse buying and some of these credit choices, um, find that they have high credit card debt, student debt. And, you know, that's something that everybody can have student debt. But what happens a lot of times with folks with ADHD is their student debt comes from a struggle in college. And maybe that debt keeps accumulating for things that classes that weren't even finished or a degree that wasn't finished. So student debt can be at an issue. Folks with ADHD are shown to have fewer assets than the general population. They have small or even zero savings. Get in a lot of financial arguments with partners, um, especially if it's a non-ADHD partner, as to how money is being managed, how um, cash flow, all those different things late bill payments that then turn to service shut off, cell phones, cable, um, electricity, water, all those things. Um, oftentimes people live paycheck to paycheck, impacts all of these areas. Um, lack of organization um, causes loss of important documents and the lack of organization of paperwork. So wow, I'd really like to pay these bills, but I don't even know where the bills are to pay them. I know I stuck them here somewhere. Um, so lots going on there. Uh, frequently there is no budget happening. So the p future planning is, is not happening. People are just going day to day, minute to minute and spending what they have in their accounts. So if you are an adult with ADHD, with a child with ADHD, you're, you may be bringing some of these challenges and difficulties right there and kind of modeling those um, for your child. Um, or if you're an adult that doesn't have ADHD, but your child does, these are the things that you want your child to be able to avoid as they grow into adulthood and, um, you know, move out and are independent and on their own. So let's take a look at some of the things that we can do um, when we are, let's see here. Nope. So this is just some information about children and financial knowledge. So not necessarily ADHD children. <laughs> These are just children in general. But um, I really found when I started digging into this, I found this super duper interesting that money habits and attitudes about money are generally set in place for kids by the time they're seven years old. Seven, they've already have that, I'm a thrifty saver person, I'm a spender, I like to think for a long time about my purchases. Those little things are already taking hold in their young brains at the age of seven. Um, and that's through a University of Cambridge study. Um, I also found it interesting, T. Rowe Price does a annual survey of parents, 
kids and money. And what they found, and you can read it here, but I'm just going to go ahead and read this one. Nearly half of parents said that they miss out on opportunities to talk to their kids about money and finances. So this isn't, again, ADHD parents. This is all parents. So if we extrapolate that out, if you're a parent with ADHD, how does that change for you? It would be interesting to see. Um, and a quarter of these same parents said that they are really reluctant and ex extremely reluctant, that's in there twice, and that's <laughs> right from the, the survey, um, to discuss financial topics with their children. So I, I don't know how you are in your family, but I know in our family, we don't always do a great job of getting into those financial topics. So when there's challenges that we know are possible or that exist in our own lives, and then even more so, we don't notice those opportunities when they come up right away, or we're really reluctant and we wanna back off on talking about them, we, are putting our ADHD children at an even bigger disadvantage. Um, and when we think of the executive function delays that our kids might have, um, up to 30% possibly in critical thinking and problem solving, goal setting and execution of those goals, time management, organization, right? So putting all those words together with financial responsibility, where our kids are and, it, and another disadvantage. And so, you know, the important thing to remember is, and you think of that age seven, it's getting an early start, right? So now if you're on <laughs> this webinar and you're the parent of a 15-year-old or an 18-year-old and you're like, oh, shoot, now what am I going to do? It's too late. It's not too late. It's never too late to, you know, teach your child new things, to get, gain um, increased understandings together even, but the earlier you can start this, the better off your kids are going to be. And it just might help you be a better manager and understander of your own money and money habits. So how exactly do we go about doing this? So I kind of broke this down into like the early years. So I'm thinking, you know, definitely before that seven year age range and up to maybe elementary school age. So prior to them being teenagers, what can we, money concepts, can we talk to our kids about that they can understand and that will start to um, kind of open up their thinking about money and financial responsibilities. One thing that we can do is we can talk about the difference between work slash chores and responsibilities and I'm going to talk about this a little later but just to give you a, a brief glimpse of that responsibilities like as parents we all have those right we have to take care of our kids we have to clean our house uh, we need to pay our bills we need to walk the dog whatever those responsibilities are that nobody unfortunately pays us for um those are responsibilities they're part of being a community they're part of being in a family those are our responsibilities the work or for our kids the chores are those things that somebody actually gives us money to do that's our motivation for doing them and you know for us as adults that's going to a job going to work and actually working um, our place of employment or our business that we have that's our work for kids those are chores right so trying to keep that that distinction in place responsibilities those things we have to do nobody pays us for them and then the chores the things that we get money for doing and they're kind of outside of those responsibilities um so a quick couple of examples you know a chore for a child might be um emptying the dishwasher right that's probably not really a responsibility anybody could in the house could empty the dishwasher but if they do that they can earn money for doing that right so that's their kind of reward for doing those things so we're going to talk about that a little later but it's it's a good distinction to have you know my kids brushing your teeth you know nope <laughs> there's no allowance there's no extra you know for that that's your responsibility and we'll work on well gosh if you brush your teeth for every morning and night for the next week then maybe you could have some extra 
screen time, or maybe you can, um, we'll go out and do something together, but I'm not going to give you money for brushing your teeth because eventually you're going to be independent and hopefully we'll brush your teeth on your own. Some of the things that start out as chores, obviously, will as students and kids get older are going to graduate into responsibilities, right? If we empty the dishwasher, <laughs> probably nobody is going to pay us for that. Unfortunately, I wish there was a way that I could get that to happen, but it's not. So just helping them understand that distinction. And the reason why, when we get a little farther into this, you'll see that. Um, talking to your kids about wants versus needs. And, you know, to little kids especially, they need everything and they want it right now, right? But no, there's really a difference between what you want and what you need. And so just starting to have that discussion. Yes, we need to have clothes. That's a basic human need, clothing. Um, but a want may be that really fancy, um, I don't know, handbag, the expensive designer label handbag <laughs> that, um, you know, all the kids are carrying to high school these days. That's a want. But it's not really a need. You do need something to carry your books and your stuff to school in, but you don't need the super expensive designer label that's a want. For little kids, they need food, right? That's something they need. They need to be eating. They, they need clothes too. They need to be eating. But when you're walking through the grocery store and they want that candy bar that's so nicely placed right in the aisle, like that's a want. They, they really don't need that. And so having helping them in the moment, not when they're throwing the fit in the grocery store, you don't want to give them a lecture about wants and needs. But as you're talking about things, even on your way to the grocery store, talk about the difference between what you really need and what you want. And explain how you manage that yourself, right? I want Starbucks today, but that's not in my budget. I don't want to spend that money. So... I, I really want my caffeine too. That's kind of a need for me this morning. So I'm just going to make my coffee at home, right? So the wants and the need, um, they're, they're different. And so helping kids understand, start to understand that. Um, the value of a dollar, right? So, <laughs> and I feel like this is really important because so much anymore, we don't always pay for things in cash. Um, I can't tell you, the last time I paid for something in cash, actually, I and I don't even write a check anymore. I don't carry my checkbook with me. I use that even less than cash, right? It's it's cards, it's debit cards, it's that sort of thing. If you have older kids, it's Venmo and um, you know Apple Cash and all those different <laughs> ways of of money transferring hands. But what is the value of a dollar, right? So when they're really little, helping them count out the money, the pennies, the dimes, the nickels, um, the dollar bills. Four, five of these $1 bills equals a $5 bill, which is kind of fun because you're getting in some of those early math concepts. So I love things that kind of get two birds with one stone. You can, you're can you helping them build their math skills for when they hit elementary school. But, you know, counting out money, helping them understand how all of that works. A great way to do this is um, to, like, when you get your receipt back, right? Because you just put your card in there and, you know, you type in your PIN and that's it. And you walk out with your groceries. Well, no, there's money attached to that. So sitting down and looking at the receipt, and saying, oh, look, this grocery store order here cost $50. You know, so think about that. That's $51 bills lined up. That's five tens, however you want to start talking about it. But then look at, wow, look at how many things I got for $50 at the grocery store today. What was the thing that cost the most money? So helping them start to just build in that concept that, that we're paying for things with money. It's not just a card that goes in and magically they let us walk out with our stuff. <laughs> it, it, no, it, it's money that we're actually giving them something in place of taking these things out of the store for them. So helping understand that, um, you know, helping understand what's super expensive. I love that, you know, my kids' 
and I, my youngest is now, <laughs> my youngest is a sophomore, or no, she's going to be a junior in high school next year. I love her perception of what's really expensive because I'm like, oh, I hope you always think like that, you know, but helping them understand what the value of a dollar is. Yeah, right. So if you want the newest toy, but it costs $20 right now, that's a lot of money for a toy like that. Or, wow, if we, you know, didn't get, if we don't go out to dinner to this restaurant and spend all this money, look at how many groceries we can get and how much that can feed us. So helping them understand some of these things about money concepts, just in general. And you can do this when kids are, are little. We always would, um, like even playing guess the restaurant bill, who can get closest, right? And, you know, when we were little, when my kids were little, we'd go to Bob Evans. And that was one of our favorite places because no matter what time you went, somebody could find something that they wanted to eat out of my four kids. So we would do a lot of eating at Bob Evans and we'd always guess the bill. And like my youngest would, you know, her thoughts a lot of times would be, oh, it's going to be like $140, you know, and you know, the bill was maybe I don't know, $40, right? She didn't have that concept yet, but it was fun to watch as she started to see, oh, oh, in her, her dollar amounts got closer and closer. But playing those little games like that help your kids start understanding what this money thing is and what it means. Um, helping you make a small um, decision about what you're going to get a small money decision. You know, you're not going to talk to your kids about your mortgage and your phone bills and your car payments, those things. Young kids are too, that, that's not appropriate for them. And it may, may not even really be appropriate in all ways for your older kids. But, you know, what, how can they help you make that small decision of, wow, I have five dollars here and I know we're you know at the grocery store and I said we could each you know go up to we have a grocery store here that has like a drink machine I don't know why but we could each get a drink but I have five dollars so what what could we get with that five dollars what should, what do you think you should get what should I helping them see and oh I don't really need that big large drink I can get a small drink and look at the change I have left so having those little, they seem inconsequential, but for your kids, that's a big help. Um, talk, start talking about savings, right? So the money isn't all about spending it <laughs> and getting something in return. Sometimes it's about putting it away for a later date. So having those conversations about saving and how you save money and how, you know, maybe part of your paycheck gets saved each month and you don't, or each pay period and you don't have it with you. Having those conversations starting the conversations about a budget. How do you budget and why, right? And that's that's a huge thing. Maybe if you have a family trip coming up, you could talk about here's the money we have to spend for our entertaining, right? So that's a budget. You have a pot of money. What what do we want to do to to use this money up? That's a, a good way to get in on starting to budget things. We're going to go on, you know, uh, uh, we're going to go buy Christmas presents for the family. How can we budget? This is our Christmas money to spend. How do we want to budget that? So, right, we can't go and spend it all on grandma because then nobody else would get gifts. So how do we break that down and, you know, so that we don't go over our amount and everybody gets to get something? So having those kind of questions about a budget and then it can increase from there. The other thing I put on here is advertising, and <laughs> you might be like, what? Well, I feel like advertising is really being pushed down to younger and younger and younger kids, right? So, and maybe it's always been like that, but as I get older, <laughs> I notice how much they, they advertise to young people. And so having kids understand what is it what's happening there right they make that sound like the biggest and the best thing and you have to have it today and it's great but really what that's what they want you to think that's what advertising is that's what commercials are that's how that's how people that have things to sell encourage you to spend their money 
with them, your money with them. And so having that talk about advertising and, you know, what that, what it means and how just because they make it seem like you need it right now, maybe you don't. Maybe could you wait? Could you wait a week and see if you still really want it? Um, and, and thinking about things like that and how that advertising is. Talking about <laughs> the grocery store aisle, the drug store aisle, that might actually be even worse. <laughs> but, right, they put all of that fun stuff right there. And it's a form of advertising because they know that people, oh, I can grab that. That's only a dollar. I'll grab this. And kids, oh, there's candy, there's gum, there's this, there's that, there's Bakugan cards, there's Yu-Gi-Man um, cards, all that stuff. It's there is a kind of an advertising because they want you to be like, oh, it's easy, I'll just spend. Or a parent who's harried and is like frazzled, they want to get out of the store and oh yeah, I'll just buy it. But being able to say no, that's what they want you to do. So I wonder how we could come up with a plan so that if you want something like that, we can we can talk about getting it, but not just because we see it right there. So it's just ways of, of changing our thinking about things and having plans built in ahead of time <laughs> so our kids don't get hit with that advertising, you know, just overload of things. Um, but those are some ideas. So now with, we've got that, that early age group. So you know, thinking of elementary, we're having these conversations. We're talking about them. But really, in practicality, what can we do? How can we do some of this? So this, this page kind of talks about one of those ways. We can give kids their chores or responsibilities. And those chores allow them to earn money, right? So it's like an allowance, but it's not just, we're not just handing it to them for, you know, breathing and living in our house and all that sort of thing. No, they're doing something to earn that money. We pay them when the work is done. We, out of that payment, require some long-term savings. So, and I'm going to talk about all of these in a little more detail. So if you're like, oh, I have questions, I hopefully we'll answer some of them. But we're going to require some long-term savings. And then there's opportunity for maybe smaller, short-term goals. Like um, they really want to save up for, and I don't even know what's the most... I don't know, they want a new bathing suit. That They saw this one online that they really like and they want that bathing suit. So they're going to save up their own money for it. Um, so a smaller personal savings thing. And then the last piece of it is talking about budgeting and tracking all of this money. So let's talk in these next few slides of how, how we would go about this plan of action. And the cool thing is, is you can do this with little kids right? You can do this with your 18-year-old. It might take a little bit of convincing for the older children who aren't used to this, but if you sit down and have a family meeting and talk about these things, you might be able to bring them on board because they may see the value in it for them. So, But it would be easy with maybe even a three-year-old or four-year-old to start putting some of this action plan in place. So I mentioned before that idea of chores and responsibilities. Chores, things that we, our kids, do for money. So some examples here of chores. And you have to think, right, what's developmentally appropriate for your child? You know, if you have a three-year-old, four-year-old doing this, they probably can't empty the dishwasher, but they might be able to help you fold the towels. That might be their chore. Um, you know, they might be able to sweep with a broom or um, with a little tiny broom. They might be able to sweep a room. They could dust. Um, they may not do it well, <laughs> right? So we're not, we want to show them how to do it. But, right, it's a four-year-old dusting. So you might have to go touch up a little bit. But if they have their part that they can do, that gives them some agency. So they're things we do for money. Um and, you know, like I said, you're, you're making these developmentally appropriate for them. Um, responsibilities, those are those things you just have to do. You don't get money for them, brushing your teeth every day, doing your homework, um, cleaning your bedroom. That could be something, maybe that starts out as a chore, and then it becomes a responsibility, right? So that can happen. Maybe the, it starts out as a chore to put the clothes away in the drawers, 
Um, and I know you're like, oh my gosh, that would be such a disaster. We'd have clothes everywhere and no one would find anything. But there's ways. We're going to talk about that. There's ways that we can help kids be able to do some of those things independently. Um, pick up after themselves, right? So it's your responsibility to, if you um, take a cup to your bedroom um, at night to have a drink while you're doing your homework, it's your responsibility to pick up and bring that back, right? You don't, it's not a chore. <laughs> you don't get money for that. That's just what you do. Um, feeding a pet, that might be your responsibility to take care of feed that pet, but maybe a chore is um, cleaning out the bedding. You know, if you have a guinea pig or a rodent type <laughs> pet, cleaning out their bedding might be a chore. A chore related to a dog, right? Going out and picking up poop. That was that was my chore. My sister and I, when we were young, we'd divide up the yard and we'd have to go. And I, I don't think we ever earned enough for that job, but we did get money for, for doing that. So it's important to, you know, to think about those things. Um, and all of those chores and responsibilities, it's really important for either one of those. The, for our kids, especially with ADHD, executive function difficulties, we break them into smaller steps, right? You cannot send a five-year-old upstairs and say, hey, or down the hall and say, clean your room, right? They're gonna, you're gonna go in 20 minutes later and they're probably gonna be sitting on the floor playing with all their Legos and it's not gonna look any different than when you send them up. But if they have an idea of what you expect from them, what does cleaning their room really mean? You know, and you, you could draw, make visuals that helps them see, um, use labels, right? When our, our toy thing downstairs, we had all these little bins. See-through bins are great because then you don't need labels. They can see in there and know what's in there, but we didn't think that far ahead. We had red and blue and green, I think, were the colors of these bins. So what we did was we labeled them, but then again, the kids, not all my kids could read, so having a word, we put a picture. So this is Legos. This is Barbies. You know, you can do that in with your kids' clothes. This is the sock drawer. This is the undies drawer. This is shirts. This is you know, shorts, and you put a little picture and the label on there. If your kids are putting their laundry away, they know where it goes. Is it going to get in there neatly? Eh, maybe not, but at least it's getting in there. And the neatness can come. Um, but, you know, you, you break those tasks into smaller steps. Even emptying the dishwasher. You know, how does how do you go about that? Well, you get out all the plates and then you put those up in the plate drawer. Then go and take the silverware thing out, walk over to the silverware drawer and put all the silverware in the appropriate <laughs> silverware spots. Don't just dump them in. Um, <coughs> and those kind of things. So we're showing the steps that need to be done. This is great, the idea of breaking things into smaller tasks. This is great for everything in your life, not just the chores and responsibilities. When kids understand the, the three things, the five things that they need to do to get something done, it makes it a lot easier for everybody. If it's visual, um, if it's somewhere where they can see it and remember it, that's great. So use labels, draw a diagram, take a picture, help your child clean up their room, right? Help them do that. You know, you're going to put pick up all the dirty laundry and it goes in the basket. We're going to pick up all the Legos and they go in the Lego box. We're going to do that. Take a picture when it's done. Look, this is a clean room. Snap, snap. This is um, a, a, a neat closet. Take a picture and put those up. You can laminate them. You can put them in little page protectors and make a little, clip them into um, a, a ring so that they have them there. And they can look so that they can be independent and not have to go, is this what mom said I was supposed to do? They know. Um, one of the things, and I love this, someone called it a make a jig and get what that was. But the, what this person meant was that you take all of your um, things that you're doing, all of your, you know, where stuff goes on the dresser or maybe where stuff goes in the bathroom, that sort of thing. And you like trace around the things and you, you kind of attach them. You take them down 
um, or put sticky tack or something to the top of the dresser. So then your child knows, okay, I'm going to put this here and that there. You can put pictures of it or whatever. So they can kind of organize that themselves. They don't need you to do it. And they're learning how to, you know, wow, there's no picture for this up here. I bet this box of Legos does not go on my dresser. <laughs> I'm going to have to figure out where it goes. Um, so those are great things for that. Your child should be able to do these things on your own, right? On their own with minimal uh, help from you. So a chore is above their developmental level if they really can't do that. You know, you have to decide where's that age appropriate level for your child, not for the neighbor down the street, but for your child for emptying the, the guinea pig cage and cleaning it out. Maybe they can do part of it, but when they're done, they have to come get you so you can make sure it's all latched up right in the guinea pig can stay in the cage and not get loose. So it's it's making these things, um, things that they can do on their own so that they feel successful. They have that agency and they gain self-confidence. I've got these things that I do and I can do them all by myself. I Just like an adult does. Um, here's a great example of a how-to kind of, you know, how can you do this? So this is a task breakdown. Step one, step two, step three, you know, you can put little pictures in each of those steps. It's great for routines, like a morning routine, which doesn't have to do with financial responsibility, but I'm just giving you another example of how you could do this. You put the pictures in, you can put words in there, but you can make up anything like this on your own to help your child. And better yet, because kids are so technology savvy, let them help you. Let them find pictures to print out and build a how-to of something. Um, the more kids get involved with things, I find the more they're like, okay, this is my thing now. It's not just mom telling me, it's mine. Look at, here's my cool chart. Um, payment. So this is the payment of this little practical plan. Um, if they do the chores, right, not the responsibilities, but the chores, they have to get paid for them. That's the commitment that you're making to each other. They do the work they get paid. Um, so big part of this, and I know, right, I put right in there, this is the hard part for people with ADHD. You have to be organized and consistent. Like you can't forget for like three months to give them their their payments. Um, you can't not be able to track how much work has been done and so then you just guess or whatever. You have to have a plan and you have to be consistent. So you get to work on your executive function um, and talk to your child about that. This is one of the things that's hard for me. But look, I'm going to do this. We're going to do it together. We're going to be accountable to each other. Um, you know, use a chore chart. Use whatever system seems to work for your family. Decide on a rate for the work, right? So, and this isn't a a presentation about that, but decide how much does do these things get that are age appropriate for your child? Um, you know, $10 for a seven year old to empty the dishwasher every night. That's not, you know, reasonable, you know, 50 cents. That might be reasonable. They do it every night and they do some of these other chores. They have the opportunity to, you know, earn this amount in a week. So it's it's looking at it like that and you could decide, you know, t based on the time, based on the complexity of a job, how much do they get? Um, make it easy for yourself, you know, put that right on the chart <laughs> so they know. And they can be like, oh, I did that five times. That's This is where the money counting from earlier comes in help helpful. That's 50 cents, a dollar, a dollar fifty. I get a dollar fifty this week from doing the um, emptying the dishwasher. I took the garbage out once. That's a gross job in the kitchen. So I did that only once. That's all I had to do. But that was a that was a dollar job. I got another dollar. So I'm going to get 250. That kind of a thing. Um, sometimes you can promote your student, right? So now they're going to do a little bit more for that job. And so when they do a little bit more, just like when you promote, get promoted, they should get a little bit more money, right? So think of that. They can't just keep doing, you know, emptying the dishwasher as a teenager and getting 50 cents because you know what? <laughs> your dishwasher is never, ever, ever going to get emptied, right? It has to be, it has to be reasonable. So maybe the job gets bigger. They have to empty the dishwasher and wash the dishes that are in the sink and put those away too, whatever that is. And that maybe increases what the payment amount is. So it's, you know, it's thinking about this kind of like a little business and how you would do those things. Um, have a set payday, right? So they don't just get the money each time they do the job. They don't get it, you know, one week they get it and then they don't get it for three weeks. 
think of it as a payday um, and set this up as a family thing. Every two weeks works pretty well. And what that helps them do, and this is big because, right, we want them to have good money habits as they move into adulthood and become independent. You do that every two weeks. It helps them learn how to stretch that money out and make it last until the next payday, right? If they get $3 one week and they go to the pool and buy one day, they spend, you know, all $3 buying, uh, what are those, nerd ropes. Um, they buy them all one day and their $3 is gone. Well, they're not getting any more nerd ropes <laughs> till they get paid again. Right. And, and being that's that consistency part for you, but helping them realize that's that's how it works in the real world. If I get my paycheck and I go out and think, oh, boom, I'm getting a new TV with this money today. I go buy a new TV. I'm not going to get paid again. <laughs> right. I've got to be able to manage that better. That's where then you can start having that discussion about budgets and how we stretch our money out. And it also, when you do it every two weeks, lets them know, wow, if I work a little bit more, I could get more money, right? So, wow, if I, maybe walking the dog is a chore. If I walk the dog every day for a week, I get $7, dollar a day, $7. If I only walk her once, because I just don't feel like it, I'm going to get a dollar. Wow, this week, I want that $7. I'm going to do that. You have to put constraints in, like your child, you, they can't walk the dog 20 times in one day and expect 20, right? It's once a day kind of thing. But that they, they get, start to see that point of the harder I work, the, the more I could earn. So it's worth it to me to put in that extra effort. Um, so that's the payment piece. Um, the required savings. Oh, I gotta gonna have to talk faster. Sorry, I always have too much to say. Um, required savings, right? So determine an amount, right? And this is money that they're gonna save up like for a longer time, like for when they go to college or when they get out of high school to make a big purchase or when they get their first apartment or whatever that is. It's we want to think about this as long into the future right? We do that as adults. We should be, right? We should be saving for when we don't work and we need money. So this helps them with that. Go with them to the bank, open a savings account for them and, and keep putting this money in there and show them how it's growing. Take it right out of their pay. If it's 30% and they get $7 that week for walking the dog, they're going to put $2 in that sense into the, um, into the savings account. Um, and, it hopefully over time will start them to understand this idea. And I love this cartoon. It's from um, Kids Practical Money Lessons, Children Can't Afford to Miss. Um, and this is, oh, Finance 102. There's a 101 book. This is the 102 book. But it shows, you know, here's, you know, this kid. And one is taking $50 in in the year 2020. Um, the other is going and buying stuff. Um, and I'm guessing every year, right? This person is taking in $50, putting in the money in the bank. The other person's buying their stuff. The other person waits 20 years to go and start putting money in the bank. When you look 20 years out from that at the difference in income, first of all, the per first person saved $12,000. Second person saved $24,000. So they're saving, you know, he, he had it in half the time, right? So he has half the money saved up. That's it right there. That's your money that you put in. But look at that interest, right? The first person, because of the length of time, the time value of money, $7,800 is what he got in interest. That second person who saved an extra $12,000, he actually has, what is that, six times as much interest as the other guy, right? So, wow. The First guy has 19,000, second guy has 72,000 just because he started earlier. So keeping that in mind, that early savings benefit is can be huge. And so just allowing that and kids earn more money, they get gifts that they want to put in that savings. Imagine how that could grow. Now, you got to put it in something high enough interest so it's, you know, 2 cents is going to be hard to see over time, but it's the idea of it and it's saving for long term that you can't just get it out when you want it. Um, if they want to save for something of their own, um, I suggest get a get a clear piggy bank. 
that they can actually put that money in and they can see it. They can see it collecting. Dave Ramsey is a big proponent of this. It's visual. It's really helpful for younger children. So this is where maybe they want to buy that new toy. Um, maybe they want to buy that new video game that came out. They want to buy the the fancy designer backpack instead of the one that you want to buy that isn't a designer backpack, right? They can save their money up for that from those paychecks. Um, and so then you talk about budgets, right? So now we have to budget, right? We're already getting 30% out. I'm going to save, you know, this much each time. I'm going to put, you know, some quarters in or whatever into my piggy bank. Um, but then how to use the rest of it, right? So if you spend it all at the beginning, you're not going to have it. What do they want to, you know, what do they want? They're coming up to a trip to grandma and grandpa's and they like they know that they get to do certain things when they're there and they'd like to take some money with them. So being able to budget so that they have that money when they want to go. Um, there's some great apps like where you could write down budgets. Obviously, you could use a spreadsheet. A great app that I found, um, it's called Budget, <laughs> Budget, Budget, um, and it's on you can get it free on you know Apple iOS Google App Store it's really simple it's not some mint or you know quicken some it's not a big money managing thing it's really simple that i think a middle school student and definitely high school students could use that to to start looking at budgeting so here's how much i'm bringing in you know from my home chores and as they get older from a job from babysitting whatever and here's all my expenses that i have coming up i've got to start paying mom for phone bills i've got to start paying for insurance whatever those are as they get older so this budget app is pretty simple easy to use and it doesn't get them lost in the bells and whistles of things they can just manage their budget um but um forbes this link here has um a a allowance and chore tracking apps. You could also search up Forbes allowance and chore tracking apps article. It, it's great. There's, I didn't research all the apps. There's, I think, 10 of them on there. Some that you have to link to your bank account, but some that are just regular. They do a lot of this stuff. They let you put a chore in and assign a dollar amount to it, even describe the tasks involved in it. And you can help your child keep track of what they're earning and then what they're spending. And some of them are attached to um, a debit card. Uh, green light, I think that always shows up in my Facebook feed. That's one of them, but there's several others. And so you're student could actually have a, a debit card that's tied to the money that you're giving them so you can help them start understanding how to use that while you still have some control over what it is that <laughs> how it works and all that so I encourage you to check that page out because it's got a lot of really cool things in it that I was like oh man I wish we had all of that when my kids were younger because I think it would have been a really big help I'm gonna switch over a little bit so we talked about the early years and money concepts that it's important to talk through with your child, to discuss, to help them understand. This is the teen years. There's more of them because obviously they're older. They can understand more, but more is happening around them. So, you know, middle school, late middle school through their teen years, even if they don't totally aren't capable of handling all of these things on their own, they can start learning about them. And you can learn about them together if it's something that you also struggle with. So talking about this um, first couple little, the pink and white purple here, these are like purchasing ideas for money concepts. So comparison shopping, right? You don't just go out and, you know, you want to buy something big, can you comparison shop? Where can you find that the cheapest? What has the best benefits when you're going to purchase something? You know, where is where do you get the best customer service? All of that, so that they realize that just because something costs um, twenty dollars at Best Buy, Target, it might only cost eighteen dollars. So thinking about those kind of comparison shopping things, talking about that um, sales. Right. So, so many times and maybe I put this in here for uh, us adults just as much, but just because something is cool and it's on sale, that doesn't mean we need to buy it. 
right now or ever, <laughs> right? That needs versus wants. Some people get all excited about sales and they buy stuff because it's cheap. It's never going to, well, if you're never going to need it, it's not something that's super important to you and not in your budget area. It doesn't matter how big they put it on sale unless it's free, <laughs> but then it's going to take up space in your house. So, you know, it, you've got to help start thinking about those things. Um, consider all the costs, right? So Amazon can be great, but if you've got to pay shipping costs for something versus something you could go to the local store and buy, you're probably better to go to the local store and buy it. Or even on Amazon, different you can find similar things with different shipping costs. So consider all the costs that are involved when you purchase something, handling costs, all that sort of thing. Um, also with purchases, think about can you buy something refurbished? Can you buy used? Can you buy an older model, right? Um, my daughter just busted her Apple Watch. I mean, it's it's busted. And I realized that's, that's a, we're very thankful that she has had this. She's a teacher now. She's out of college. But, you know, we talked about the idea of it probably, hers is old. It probably is time. It's going to cost just as much to buy a new one as it's going to be to fix this one, probably. Because um, I don't even know, since it's the older version, how the parts, all that stuff. So, but does she need the newest one? Or could she go with one that's a little older but still does more than the one she had, right? So it's it's thinking about that kind of stuff. Using promo codes and discounts and sales and coupons, those are all things important when making um, purchases. Kids need to know there's income taxes. When you go get a job, you're not going to get all that cash. Um, same thing even with little kids about sales tax, right? If they go up to buy something because grandma gave them money and they have $2 and they bought something for $1.99 but it has sales tax, they're not going to have enough money. So explaining that, making sure people understand the total cost of ownership, right? I want to buy a car. I need a car. I've got the money for a car. Great. You got to put gas in it. You've got to pay for parking maybe at your work. You have to get the registration. You need to get oil changes. You need insurance. It's going to break down, all that stuff. Total cost. You might want to get a lesser costing car so you have more money to do that. Talking about credit cards, the benefits, there's definitely benefits to credit cards. It helps build your credit score. It can be um, useful in an emergency. You've got to buy a tire because yours just blew up, but you don't have any cash. That's great. You can use that, save the cash, pay it back. But it can also cause a lot of trouble, especially in college when these kids start getting all of these credit card offers. Ugh, you know, and so if they start learning how to manage that well while they're in high school, that's going to be a big help. Understanding a credit score, what's that mean? Why is it important? Talking about insurances, different kinds of insurance. What kind of insurance do we have? We have health insurance. We have car insurance. We have life insurance. We have home insurance. If they get a place, they need renter's insurance. All those different kinds of things. Investing, that general talk about how you invest money and what that means and how you make smart investments versus what seems hot at the moment and can then, you know, if you put all your money into that, all of a sudden it goes way down and you're out of luck. Um, some other things here, delayed gratification, savings help teach it. When kids save, that helps teach, I can save my money and I don't have to just go and spend everything. Don't need to keep up with the Joneses, right? We don't know what the Joneses situation is. The Joneses may have all the neatest, newest stuff. They also might be hundreds of thousand dollars in debt. So, don't worry about keeping up the, with the Joneses. Keep up with yourself. Um, upgrades aren't often necessary. That kind of goes back into the idea of the Apple Watch. You don't need to get the best and newest Apple phone or newest Google phone, all those things. Gratitude. Appreciate what you have, right? Appreciate that. Appreciate how lucky you are um, and the things that, are, that you have, the family that you have. It's not all about money. Live below your means. Take care of your stuff right? Don't leave things out that are going to get ruined because you're going to have to buy it again. Take care of it. Do the right thing. Wash your car, wax your car, clean your car, right? You got to take care of your stuff because that really affects your ability for money. Freedom is tied to the amount of debt we have, right? I can be so much more free to do the things I want to do if I'm not tied down to paying my debt, keeping that in mind, and then planting that retirement seed and watching it grow. Um, I love this quote from Oprah Winfrey, again, from the Practical Money Lessons book, but it talks about that gratitude and how important that 
can be for everybody. Be thankful for what you have. You'll end up having more. If you concentrate on what you don't have, you will never, ever have enough. You're always going to be wanting. So if you're thankful for the things you have, you'll have more than you realized. And helping your kids learn that, I feel like in some ways, curbs impulsivity can help with those maybe making a poor decision. They can think about that and make a different choice. I, this might be the most fundamental lesson of all. Be thankful for what you'll have and you'll end up having more. Um, this is information, my email address. If you have questions, I know we're going to send out the um, replay, send out the slides um, so that you can, if you didn't get all of this, you can get it through those. But if you have questions, definitely feel comfortable shooting me an email um, and I'm happy to answer anything for you. How do I wean my adult kid off things he probably doesn't need? I think that, first of all, knowing that they are, um, they're adults. And unfortunately, there is not always much as parents we can do to make that those things happen, right? We, we kind of lose that control, right, that, that just... Yeah, they're adults. So some things that you can do, though, I think that are great is if you can have com start having conversations about money, about bigger goals. What do you want, you know, out of life? What do you want to be able to do, you know, with your money? Think of all those things, you know, and start having some of these conversations. But you're going to talk as a to a an adult versus starting as a young child, and you know. Would it be helpful if I um, helped you set up a budget? What would that be like if you had a budget? And it might be hard at first to keep you know up with this budget, but if you were able to save some money so you could go on um, a trip with your friends or whatever it is that your child might want. But you know, it, it is that hard place. Um, but I think the biggest thing is being there for them, not as like their their catch all to help them pay. For all this stuff that maybe they don't need and they want, but but to say, hey, I'm noticing some things. I noticed that your paycheck seems to be gone right away. What what would you like to do about that? And so I'm a coach, right? So it's applying that coach approach of you know helping people, pointing something out to someone, and then saying, what do you, what do you want to do about that? Is how does that feel to you? each month, each paycheck, when you realize that, oh my gosh, you don't have enough. So kind of, you know, helping them them see those sort of things and, and seeing how it could be different. What could they do if they didn't spend that money? What, what could they do with that money that might be really meaningful to them? Um, Donna says that her 11-year-old daughter doesn't really ask for a lot of material things. Um, and she recognizes that's a blessing, but she's finding it hard um, to find ways to incentivize her. So um, her daughter likes video games. Um, what, what can she do? So if you're looking for those incentives for like the responsibilities, being able to offer additional screen, you know, screen time for video games. I know that's always a big contention with families. So, you know, compressing that, you know, you can have extra screen time if you get your bed made, whatever those responsibility things are that she just needs to do. But if you're, if you're, so it's, you know, incentivizing through what her currency is for those things. And it sounds like her currency is video games, screen time. So allowing that to be what's, you know, what she gets extra of. And what I'm thinking of is if you are looking at helping her understand how to use money and how to think about money, because while she might not be too interested in it right now and doesn't, you know, maybe want a lot of things, she may, that may change <laughs> in the future. So setting it up right now for her. So maybe if there's games that she wants to buy, right, or if she wants to be able to purchase, um, you know, I know a lot of games have in-app purchases or whatever, but so setting up the chores with the money and 
that she can use. However, like once that's hers, it's kind of hers to choose what to do with. So maybe that will help her be able to save up for a new video game if she knows one's, one is coming out. Or if she likes to, and I am so far out of <laughs> current video game language. So if you're, if you're like laughing at me at right now, and when I say this next stuff, you can, but I know that there's games where you can purchase like a, a, um, like a, uh, what do I want to call it? Like a clothing pack or something that your, you know, your cat that you're in the game with can have different clothes. And that actually does cost money, which, you know, to me, I'm like, that seems crazy, but maybe that's how you incentivize your child. If she wants those things, right? You're not paying for those. She can, do the chores, she will get paid, and then she can use her money to to do that. You know, maybe it's through you, you're going to pay for it, but she has the money that she's earned that she can use that for. So I think looking at ways like that, that'll help her learn some of those bigger life lessons, but maybe get something that she never even thought she could have before, um, you know, by earning her own money to do those sort of things. So I think it's looking at it you know, in that way. So hopefully that helps answer that a little bit. But yeah, there's a lot of talk about incentivizing and how do you really do that for your child? And it has to be something that's important to them. I opened a savings account for my 11 year old daughter years ago, um, but the low interest rate makes it hard to teach her the time value of money um, as we used to be able to. Um, what's your advice for that? That is really difficult to do um, because, yeah, it, you know, it, it, it gains so little. Um, so I think some of it is fi finding a way, if it's possible, to be able to put it into um, a higher interest account. Um, sometimes I have had clients who have put things in like, like the 529 accounts um, and that grows a little faster, but it's thinking kind of being um, creative in how you do that. I think some of those apps will let you do some things a little differently. Um, but even even if she's not seeing that time value of money right from what's actually her money, but being able to see um, that, wow, I'm actually getting money here and it's growing and growing. And then if you're able to like, pull up examples like I, I, I showed you of, you know, this is where if people, you know, if there's enough there, can you invest that in a, um, like a, a and I, I'm not good at what the name of this financial document, <laughs> a financial instrument is, but it's, it's like a, a, for minors investment account. So can you put it in something like that and add the money to there and it grows for them? Um, so it might involve you talking with a financial advisor to be able to do that. Um, but, you know, you can open up a, the same as you open up a, you know, a miner's savings account, you can open up um, investment accounts that you can put into a mutual fund that's, you know, that can maybe earn more and she could see how that money grows. And then that also checks off the investing box too, because you're describing how you keep putting money in there. First of all, that money is there, but then if you're in these, you know, things that over time, your money will keep growing and growing and growing at bigger and bigger um, volumes. So um, kind of maybe look at something like that for, for her. Thank you, Christine. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you wanted to cover before we wrap up today? Like I mentioned, um, you know, I really found this um, to be a super interesting topic. And I, I'm hoping that I may take some of this because I have so much more research. That was my hyper focus this week. <laughs> Way more research that could even fit into this. But um, I would hope to um, develop maybe a, like a, a small class or a course or something or a workbook that might be useful for families. And if I do that, um, you know, as long as it, it works with Chad, sharing that with you all um, through, through your email, I don't know how long they keep that, but you know, that might be something that is in the future that is something that I could share out with you guys. Um, if I can, <laughs> if I can corral all of my information into something even deeper than just this um, webinar deep dive. Thank you so much, Christine, for all the great information and tips. 
And thanks to everyone for joining us. We appreciate you being here.